Hey everybody, Rhino here, the world's strongest pro bodybuilder and inventor of the cooler, the world's only cooler, it holds a gallon of ice water and keeps your pre and post workout drinks all together inside one ice cold container. So you're probably wondering what the hell a bodybuilder slash power lifter knows about speed training. But truth be told, most of the high school, collegiate, and professional athletes I've trained over the last 25 years play sports like football, soccer, basketball, or they run track. Along with many other sports growing up, I played soccer since I was six years old. And I received a college scholarship offer to play soccer. I was only 130 pounds in college, so my coach told me to hit the gym and lift some weights the summer before the season started. I fell in love with weightlifting, so I never went back. I went on to study exercise science in college, and I did a coaching internship under a PhD and coached high school soccer. I was also an RA in the dorms at the University of Oregon, where we housed hundreds of track athletes every summer that were there for clinics and competition. For those that aren't familiar, the University of Oregon is known as Track Town USA. It's where Phil Knight invented Nike. And it's where the Olympic track and field trials are often held. That's where I cut my teeth in the world of strength and conditioning coaching. Back in the early 90s, I was working with some of the U of O football players and track athletes. And that's where I first met IFBB Pro bodybuilder Keith Williams. He was a 170 pound sprinter out of Taft Junior College. He was training with Oregon's running back at the time, Dino Filia, and a fullback named Stanley Johnson. After we all talked for a bit, they wanted to train with me full time through track season and into the football season. I told them I'd help, but they had to do my program. They couldn't do my workouts and the track workouts and the football workouts. We had to have one plan of attack and stick to it. It's important when designing a program for athletes that you understand they only have so much physical capital and it has to be invested wisely. And you need to optimize their strength, conditioning, and sports specific skills while still allowing adequate time for recovery. The amount of time and focus on each discipline changes depending on whether they're off season or preseason. So this was hard for Dino because he was on U of O's track team at the time, but they agreed 100%. So much so that Dino actually went to track practice and told his coach he couldn't do as much running with the team and he would be leaving practice early and strength training with me. Dino told me that coach publicly chastised him in front of the other sprinters and says he wasn't a team player and he was just focused on football. I thought about this last year when ESPN did a 30 for 30 expose on Bo Jackson and in the film Bo said he went to football practice and he said coach I'm not gonna run all those laps and Bo knew his body and he knew all the extra running would break him down and make him weaker. Of course the coach didn't say anything because he was Bo Jackson I mean that's your franchise. But Dino wasn't Bo Jackson, and he was taking a big risk. That meant a lot to me. They trusted me so much, but it also held me accountable because I didn't want to let them down. I wanted to prove to them and their coaches that they were doing the right thing. Now, these guys were great athletes, but I told them they had to get bigger and stronger to play football in the NFL. I assured them they'd get faster as well. Of course, I told them they had to sleep better, but I told them they'd have to eat a lot more food to fuel the workouts and grow. They used to eat mostly skinless chicken breasts, so I asked them to add red meats and to eat more frequently in order to get their calories up. I also had them put down a lot more carbs, and I made them bring a big shake to the workout so I could see them consume calories after we trained. Most of the time they'd forget, but I always brought extra. Now, I'm no shake fan, but it's hard to get young athletes, especially busy college students who are on a budget, to eat enough food to fuel growth. I knew they trained hard, but they didn't eat and sleep enough, so I kept drilling that into their heads every single day. All you do when you lift weights and play sports is break down muscle tissue. It's just the stimulus. Muscle is made at the dinner table. They also trained too much, which impeded their growth. Too much jogging, too much running around doing drills, and too many reps and sets of exercises that I didn't think were optimal for increasing strength. I still see it a lot today. Excessive jogging around and lengthy warm-ups and stretching and too many low ROI drills like ladders and cones and jump roping. 
and not enough time spent building the strength and power necessary to be explosive. Some coaches pride themselves on blowing their whistle and doing gassers until someone drops, but the problem with that is once form breaks down, you're just reinforcing bad technique. There's a place for some of these exercises, but the priority in the off season should be placed on building a solid foundation of strength. Some coaches try and kill two birds with one stone, and they combine athletic movements with resistance, like sand sprints or parachute training. The problem with this concept is that you never optimize either one. There's no progressive component to the resistance, so an athlete quickly hits a ceiling for results. So I reduce their workload, and I increase their recovery time by shortening training sessions to less than an hour, and we did what I believed were the best exercises for increasing strength and speed, power clean and power jerk, which I used to call uprights to a press, high bar squats and front squats, which I feel are better than low bar squats because they keep the shin and the back at angles that are a more sports specific position, developing more of the quads and glutes, whereas low bar squats, they tend to have a more vertical shin and they load the hips and lower back. Now we also did some deadlifts and RDLs for hamstrings and of course some bench presses and chin-ups, but it was all free bar movements, no machines. Please don't put athletes on hammer strength machines. Just don't. The rep ranges were generally five reps with the lats set to failure and the number of reps really, or the number of sets depended on how tired we got or uh, you know how, how quickly our strength dropped off. Intensity was paramount. Every workout was like a competition. These guys went to war every day we trained. I can remember on many occasions, some of the ball players would hear what these guys were doing and they wanted to come down and get a workout in with us. They'd show up and get halfway through the workout, then they'd puke and that was the last we'd ever see them. Now increasing strength can definitely increase speed and improve athletic performance. But it's important to understand that it's not a linear equation. I'm not suggesting everyone become a power lifter. Going from a 100 pound squat to a 400 pound squat will yield amazing results in athletic performance. But after a certain point, there's diminishing returns. Going from a 400 squat to a 500 or 600, that'll demand way more time and effort than it will return in terms of improved performance. It can take months or even years to develop significant strength, which is why I think it's important to start early, such as in high school. And maintain that strength takes less time and effort, which can better be spent on sports-specific skills. Now, over the years, the vast majority of guys that stuck with the program, they ended up in the NFL. Dino, Keith, and Stan each gained over 15 pounds in four months. And I found that to be typical for the athletes that I've trained in this manner. These guys were elite college athletes in their late teens and early 20s. So this was definitely an aggressive approach. And I don't wanna to go too far off the rails here, but I've done a lot of work with high school athletes. And I get lots of inquiries from parents who wanna know about training and diet for their kids. Generally speaking, there's a few things that should be taken into account. Now, number one, genetics reign supreme. Not everyone is gonna be a professional athlete. And more importantly, certain body types and certain genetic predispositions are better suited for different sports. For instance, my stepson, Samoan, he was 6'1", 300 pounds when he was 15. Probably not gonna beat any Kenyans in the 5,000 meter, no matter how hard he tries. Number two, kids before puberty and after puberty are two totally different animals, or better said, before testosterone and after testosterone. Strength training isn't nearly as effective before puberty, but practicing the barbell movements and learning proper sprint technique can be very helpful. Three, generally speaking, the fastest kids in fourth grade will be the fastest kids in college. And generally speaking, those are the stronger kids with the better genetics. And number four, kids who play multiple sports growing up are the better athletes in college. Don't specialize too early, unless your daughter wants to be an Olympic gymnast, in which case she'll be retired by the time she's 16 if she hasn't had multiple elbow and knee surgeries first. I hope everyone understands that these are very general guidelines and it's impossible to account for all the variables for every different, different sport and age group and the goal of every athlete. But as you can see, I'm big on the basics. And unless and until an athlete has built a solid foundation 
I'm reluctant to incorporate too many specifics. Now, Stanley Johnson received a scholarship and played Division I ball for Norfolk State. Then he went on to earn an MBA at Michigan. Stan and I have been business partners for 15 years. We built a very successful telecommunications company together. Then we developed single family, multifamily, and uh, commercial real estate. And now we run an engineering firm. Keith Williams went on to play college football for Minnesota. And then he went to the national track championships and won the 100 meter dash. He also beat Carl Lewis in the 60 meter indoor. And he represented Nike at the 1996 Olympic trials where he ran against some of the best runners in the world. Names like John Drummond, Leroy Burrell, Maurice Green, and Carl Lewis. Then Keith played NFL ball for Green Bay and Denver, and he later became an IFBB pro bodybuilder. As for Dino, he went on to take second in the Pac-10 championships that year behind the guy who would eventually win the bronze medal at the Olympics. His track coach was very proud and he apologized to Dino. Dino went on to set the record for the most touchdowns scored in the season and the Ducks went to the Rose Bowl that year. Dino was drafted into the NFL by the Patriots and went on to play for the Panthers and the Saints. The following year, Paul Wiggins joined us and he ended up getting drafted in the fourth round and paid for the Green, Green Bay Packers and the Denver Broncos. And now he's president of the engineering firm Stan and I own. These are great stories about great athletes who became great friends. Well, that's my rant. And as always, thanks for listening.